but um, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from you about the solutions. And um, one thing I just want to observe, though, is that um, there's a diversity within the diversity. When we see, say, ethnocultural communities, there's so many communities that are in, that are involved in that. And the reality is, different communities are facing different forms of issues around representation. Um, so, if we're looking at solutions, I'd actually really like to um, people, if they can, reflect on the idea of allies. The reality is that um, you can have somebody of color, for example, working in the newsroom, but if, if they're not necessarily connected you know, to the Somali community, they're not necessarily going to really pitch that, whereas it might be somebody who actually isn't of color, who does have a connection to the Somali community, who would. So I'm very interested in, when we talk about solutions, we can talk about the issue of allies. Um, we, you know, we could have people from our community there, but there's also many people who aren't from our communities who also could be looking out. Um, and also an interesting fact, um, the largest um, community of African descent is the Somali community nationally. Start. Um, solution, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, f first we got to figure out what the what the problem is, it, and and is the problem that uh, these communities are not being represented, and are they not being represented aesthetically, or in the stories, or in the uh, frequency at which these stories are, are, are covered. There's lots of, lots of things to uh, take a look at there. But um, if Will and Kate uh, went to Somalia, um, it would be a story. So uh, there's something there, right? New stories are built in, uh, in a certain way, uh, and we're taught in J school, uh, that there's a certain appeal and style to certain news stories. So, you know, apart from having individuals in the newsroom that um, are committed to, to telling these kinds of stories that are not being told, um, also a, a commitment from the newsroom to say, okay, we are going to take these stories and we are going to uh, make it appealing um, in the same way that... Uh, that another story would, would, would be appealing. And, and there's ways to do that. I just don't think newsrooms um, are focused on, uh, on bringing those stories out because it's also a, a consumer and, and producer uh, relationship, right? So, you know, if we're talking about Somalia, 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 and people aren't watching, uh, then, there's a, then there's an issue. But if we all wake up at 7, 5 a.m. to watch Kate's Dress and Peter, uh, you know, live from London, then, uh, then there's something there. What's what's going on? Um, you know, what's what's the appeal of that kind of story? So if we get to the root of that, I think there is absolutely ways to uh, make these stories that aren't aren't spoken about, aren't talked about, um, appealing in a way that's beneficial for both uh, the the producers of the news, uh, for the consumers, and for those uh, who are, are invested uh, financially into the news as well. So, you know, what's the story and how, how do we get these stories out? Not only how do we get it out, how do we make it um, appealing and mutually beneficial for the, both the producer and the consumer? But that, that I do not know. No, they should hire me. They should hire me. <laughs> CBC, CBC, Global, CNN, Fox News, The Daily Show, all of them, Al Jazeera, <laughs> should hire Ian Ketaku. 613, I don't know if they watch Rogers. 8834265. Okay, so uh, if we talk about the, um, the importance of uh, Kate and William uh, tour, and I would say it's kind of ranking, and this is what we, we teach students in media schools, um, uh, agenda setting of the mass media. This is how the mass media function. Uh, how the media is ranking for us today, uh, number one is that story, number two is that the second story, and so on. This is the whole function of the mass media. But if we think about the solution, and ultimately what we can work, is that we think about agenda setting as three different agendas. The first one is the policymaker agendas. So government, uh, people in power, and so on. This is one sphere of, of uh, stories that occupies them. Second agenda or second sphere is the um, uh, public agenda that we care about. So we care today about, uh, for example, Somalia and how we can 
make donation or, or contribute in, in to help those human beings, or fellow human beings, and so on. So this is another sphere of agenda. The third sphere of agenda, which is very important, is the media agenda themselves. The, the media agenda. Ultimately, media has their own agenda. Uh, be it the producer, be it the uh, uh, reporters, the editors, and so on, and also the media ownership, which is crucial when you think about you know mainstream media versus uh, alternative media. And for me, uh, what I can see a plausible solution, at least uh, theoretically, is the uh, the blend of the three different agenda together. So if the mass media will be representing their own agenda plus the public agenda, looking and hoping that the policymaker would be reflecting their, their agenda, ultimately we can see lots of voices here heard. And hence, when we tune to CBC or CTV or the like, we can hear different voices and different point of views and, and so on. So this is um, uh, one possible solution. Am I allowed to, to have another take? <laughs> yeah, or we can speak. Um, you can go back to it. Oh, okay. okay, because I have another positive aspect, of course. Stay tuned, stay tuned. <laughs> Um, I, I agree uh, in that you know everyone does have an agenda. I mean that that's that's the way of the world, um, and uh, goes all the way to the top in terms of uh, the ownership of different media outlets. Uh, but I think that uh, um, something or someone that can make the difference is really the public, um, because at the end of the day, the public uh, uh, members of the public are the ones who are the consumers, and uh, you know they showed well in Cape because everyone wanted it. If no one was watching it, I mean, I know that it's maybe unrealistic because no one is buying the magazines. Do you think they're going to put them on the cover again? So it really is, it's, it's, it's individuals that all form this, this mass media, right? Um, you know, if, if you like something, you should write in. If you don't like something, you should write in even more. Because if you, by staying silent, um, no one is going to know. And, and um, you know, I, I know that, for example, where, where I work at CTV, we do get, you know, viewer emails, and, and they do mean something. They do get read. Every single one of them uh, gets read. What they do with them, um, of course, it, you know, is, is, is beyond uh, in an individual's control, but as collectively, they do get read. And, and I mean, if, if there are hundreds of emails coming in, you know, demanding coverage of, of whatever issue it is, I'm, I'm sure that that would be, you know, there would be more of a chance of that being examined if it was an issue that was uh, that was less talked about or less uh, less sexy or less glamorized out, out there at, at the moment. But uh, and I, I also think that I mean, when we're talking about media, but social media is is really the new medium of, of choice these days for when it comes to news, when it comes to any kind of um, uh, in terms of getting stories out there. And that's another way of, of, of driving, you know, which way the media goes in, in terms of what topics are covered. So I certainly, you know, encourage people to, I mean, that's, that's where it starts. It has to start somewhere, and I know that it, uh, we've all heard it before, it all starts with one person, but it really does. And, and it'll build from there, and, and hopefully that will drive uh, a different agenda. Yeah, and I'm going to echo that um, as well uh, in terms of, I think that we're at an interesting moment in time when we think about how maybe mainstream media can actually interact with social media. And I think that there's huge opportunities there. I can't tell you what I think the solution is on that, but I think that there definitely are huge opportunities. And possible things that I've been thinking about have been since Shelby sent the question was that, you know, imagine, I mean, we're talking about youth today. Imagine if you, you know, hand over to youth um, capabilities, a, a, a camera, simple editing, or different tools that they can use to go out on the street and get the stories that they're living and that they're breathing and that they're experiencing in their communities and a way for them to share that with the world, then, you know, that's giving them experience, it's giving them influence, it's giving them all kinds of opportunities um, that folks will, um, will 
folks, hopefully, that have power will, will recognize. I mean, YouTube is powerful. I mean, it goes around the world like crazy. So I think, um, and, you know, giving access to our youth who are perhaps underrepresented or don't have the means to be able to do that is a possible solution. Um, I al and I also think that that, and of course not staying silent. We need to voice our concerns, as has already been said. And what I also find interesting about maybe, again, mainstream media is that, that I think media has to take a look at how it actually may be, um, well, influencing the, the stereotypes or influencing what I would call sort of subversive racism or whatever have you. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you've got a story on, I can't think of specifics now, but if you've got a story about um, maybe it's, it could be Somalia, it could be, um, you know, it could be about um, uh, Muslim terrorism or whatever have you, and the only people they interview are a Muslim woman maybe in a hijab. You know, well, there's all kinds of Muslim women out there. Some wear hijab, some don't. So, I mean, let's give the face of whatever story you're carrying, um, you know, different representation. If you're talking about unemployment or if you're talking about, you know, middle class issues, you know, how come we're only talking to a white male? Um, those are the kind of things that I think drive stereotypes, um, you know, where we, we, we still look at um, if it's a minority um, visible minority issue, only visible minority folks sometimes are talked talk to. Um, and sometimes when it's actually a visible minority issue, sometimes they're not even talked to. Depends on whatever lens is taken. So I find that very interesting. So to me, I think that if we can start to shift that in mainstream media, it would certainly be helpful. And let's recognize that the relationships that folks from different backgrounds and ethnocultural backgrounds can build with folks in our community are very, very different. The relationship you can build will be maybe one that's based on more trust if we don't have just um, predominantly white folks sharing the news or going into ethnocultural communities and asking the questions. Because you're going to get a different story, depending on who asks the question.